Um, <clears throat> yeah, so going back to the Rodriguez method and make a list of the resources, um, I guess this slide fits uh, under that parameter. Um, so there's some practical inspiration. There was two main practical inspirations for my fourth feature film, Sam and Dan Get Lost. It was originally called Blokes, but then I found out there was an Australian comedy called Blokes, which is, uh, it's, an, it's an Aussie term as well, isn't it, that they've appropriated, I guess. Um, and I was also reading a screenplay book called Save the Cat, which said that, you know, high concept films, even though they don't call them that these days, but they kind of, it kind of says what it, it does on the tin. So, yeah, so I changed the title. So, there, yeah, there was two practical inspirations for Sam and Dan Get Lost. Um, the first one was to do a winter shoot. Because um, typically, Neville, Neville Rumble was filmed from the spring to the autumn, just the start of the autumn. And Fretting was a summer film. So it just occurred to me, maybe a bit too late in the day, because then we didn't have much time to actually prep it. But uh, it occurred to me, let's do a, a night film. Let's do a, a winter shoot. Uh, you know, usually when we're hibernating and we're all tucked away, um, why don't we be productive and actually get the shooting part of the movie done, you know, th um, and the run up to Christmas and then from Christmas up to spring. Um, great idea, idea on paper. Um, when it actually comes to the reality of it, shooting at weekends and you've been at work for most of the week and it's really cold, and then on top of that, we decide that one of the actors is going to be in a dressing gown. I mean, it was um, it was a little bit tougher than um, maybe we'd reckoned. But that was one of the initial inspirations. Let's be productive um, while it's cold and while it's dark. Um, and so leading on from that, I'd never owned a, a full framed a full frame camera. The Canon 60D, as you know, was cropped. Um, and everyone was going mad about two years ago. I think the Sony A7S Mark III is just coming out. Um, but the hype was on for the Sony A7S. Um, the second model shoots 4K. This one just does 1080. And its ability to see into the night. Um, and so that, and that kind of fitted in with the idea. I think like the two ideas came kind of simultaneously. Let's do a winter film. And obviously that's going to necess necessitate a night shoot. And then everyone was going mad for the A7S. So again, the, X, the new Xbox collection got sold back to CEX. I think I laid down 30 pounds for this. And I was, again, I was lucky I got quite a, a nice um, camera body. Um, I'm going to talk about the kit in a minute, so I won't talk about that now. So, so yeah, so they were the two main practical reasons for why Sam and Dan Get Lost came about, based on the Rodriguez method of using resources. Um, the creative inspiration, again, it's not like a direct path. You might get a few ideas and they'll coalesce and this other thing happens. So I walk a lot along the cut from Hinkley to Neneaton, because I live in Hinkley now, my family's in Neneaton, and I was just walking the dog. And on, is, is it Lutterworth Road or Loughborough Road? Lutterworth Road on the way through um, Whitestone on the way to Nuneaton. They were doing loads of tarmac in and I just saw this wagon with the keys left in the ignition and I just thought, I could just jump in there and have a way with this lorry. And that, that was just one of the initial sparks that I had in my head. So I had the idea of a winter film, I had the camera, I had this idea of someone being spontaneous and the next thing was I got it, I reached out to an actor friend of mine. Um, this chap here, Richard Baldwin, he's involved in the Abbey Theatre. And we'd never worked together, but we kind of knew of each other and we were Facebook friends. So I said to Richard, I said, look, I'm, I've got this crazy idea, let's do a winter film. Um, I knew that Richard was in a, an improvisation group called the Improlectuals, and I'm, they've done some gigs at the Abbey as well, um, in, in, in the foyer there. Um, and he said, yes, I know a number of people. Um, I'll bring someone along. So I, think, I said, I think about doing this two-hander. Um, so he said, yeah, I'll, I'll see who I can rustle up. Didn't know if it would be a man or a woman. Anyway, at Costa Coffee, there we go, in the rope walk. Um, on a Sunday morning, um, Richard, this is Robert Lane, the other guy that's in the Improlectuals in the imp improvisation group. Excuse me. We all sat down and we had a coffee. And was 
I did undersell to Robert the fact that I just finished wasted in under ten days, um, and that that may be, that may be the case with someone and get lost, and it wasn't. It's um, we're still not quite finished yet because lockdowns kind of got in the way. But anyway, we just started to chat. Um, as well as being a terrific actor, um, Robert's day job is as a troubadour, as a singer songwriter. So again, a bit like Fretin, um, he plays a guitar. And we just, Robert was talking about, um, you know, what it's like to be validated as an artist. Do you just do it for the love of it? Do you do it just to make some money? You know, what, what does someone need to feel a success, a success or a failure? Um, so that all this kind of thing was being fed into the conversation. Richard was talking about the fact that he likes to play uptight characters. And then he, he got the notion, hey, if we're going to do a, a film about, a night film in the winter, wouldn't it be funny if you wore a dressing gown? So again, all these ideas were coming together and it was like, right, okay, I'll go away and I'll write something. Let's, we need to get, this was kind of, I don't know, mid January. So if we were going to do a winter film and it wasn't that long until the nights were going to, the, the clock was going to, what is it? Spring forward. Is that right? The clocks were going to change. So the pressure was on. Definitely so, getting an Arthur Dent vibe from uh, Richard in a dressing gown, if that was the intention. Yeah, Arthur Dent. Um, homeless Hugh Hefner is one of the lines that got into the script as well. But yeah, definitely Arthur Dent, definitely. Um, that was what, yeah, that was one of the touchstones. Um, now, I wouldn't do this again because I did spend a few weeks writing fretting. Um, Wasted was, a, just to talk about the script on Wasted, actually, the, the Wasted, my, my arty film, um, it was based on Christopher Nolan's following and also an Iranian film called uh, Davinder. It's the runner. Um, and I really just had waypoints and I, I wasted wasn't scripted. I just had certain waypoints where this character was going to go. And then we really just, we filled in the gaps anyway. And fretting was written over a few weeks. Um, Sam and Dan get lost was written in a week and in retrospect, it was probably too quick, but needs must. So, so that's what we went with. Um, this is kind of the theory of writing that's situational. Um, Stephen King does this. He creates a situation and then he sees where the characters are going to take him. So I kind of had the situation now where we've got one character, Robert, the troubadour, the busker, who is a, who is who um, needs to be spontaneous. We've got the other up, uptight guy. And I just kind of thought of a way that they could meet. And then it, we just I just started to write the script and see, you know, where it, took me um i mean especially with fretting the subconscious just created all the themes like i say all your life experience is going to come through anyway um i kept it to 70 pages because in my experience they say it's a page a minute a one page equates to one minute screen time but in my experience it's it's easy it's easy for that to run over so 70 pages seemed a good length um yeah so it's purposely underwritten um, and as I said, we didn't have much prep time. So I've just finished the screenplay for the next film, Gretchen and I, which again is a buddy film. So Fretting is a buddy film. Sam and Dan Get Lost is a buddy film. And Gretchen and I is a buddy film. So it seems to be maybe that's my raison d'etre. That's where I'm, I need to go. Um, but on Gretchen and I, on the new one, I'm definitely going to just let it soak in and spend, you know, especially with lockdown, it's obviously perfect. Um, one little silver lining I'm definitely going to spend the time and just because I want it to be really rich with jokes I'm really going to spend the time um on the next one but yeah um Sam and Dan Get Lost was written at speed um okay I used old glass on this brand new camera I mean I could have bought a new 28 millimeter lens a Tamron or something I don't know but I didn't you know I'm a bit of a tight wad, so spending a few hundred on, on a lens didn't seem to be an option. Um, so I had a, I got a Hoya 28 mil um, lens and I just had a dumb adapter that was about 15 pounds off eBay. Um, so obviously, you know, you need to set the settings yourself. It's not going to talk to the lens. I have got another 28 millimeter lens that actually has been adapted and it does talk to the camera, but I shot um, Sam and Dan Get Lost primarily on the 28 mil. Um, and it just really tickles me that you've got this new technology, you've got this new DSLR 
and you're putting glass on it that's 30, 40 years old and that, you know, still holds up and gives you a great image. So why not? And there must be a market for it because, you know, there's loads of those adapters um, available. I'll talk a little bit more a, bit, a little bit later about why I chose a wide lens. But anyway, the... <clears throat> There's massive talk about the A7S sensor. I don't know what ISO it goes up to, if it's like half a million or something. And there's videos that where short films are shot under moonlight, um, you know, and just the, the, they crank up the ISO so it starts off with a dark scene in the woods and then, it, you know, it just looks like some military infrared vision. Um, so I was really excited once I'd got my hands on the A7S to see what the sensor could do. Um, and in, from my tests that I did, up to 3200 ISO is acceptable and the grain's acceptable. Um, but if you push it beyond that, it does start, the image starts to break up. And initially I was really disappointed with that, but then I had to remind myself on the Canon 60D, there's a few night shots in Wasted. And in fact, I did day for night probably for this reason, but around 800 ISO was your limit. And then it, the, the image was breaking up. So, Compared to the 60D, 3200, and you can push it to 6400, it's, it's still um, pretty damn good. Um, the other thing that the, a, the A7S sensor gives you is um, your depth of field. You don't have to shoot wide open. You could actually stop, especially because, and I'll come to the way I was framing it, but you've got two actors in shot. So you want a wider depth of field to make sure that they're both in focus and the sensor gave you that option that you just you didn't just have to shoot wide open i know um george lucas on american graffiti when they were shooting that they were just shooting wide open all the time and it was just a nightmare for the camera operators to to keep that focus so that was another advantage of the sony a7s sensor um just a little bit of geekery um at the same time i'd also bought the I traded in a bunch of other stuff and I got the, um, the Panasonic GH4. Um, and on the Canon 60D, I had a bespoke um, viewfinder, but there's a newish product out called the Swivel. Um, and this is actually, you can change it on the X and Y axis. So it actually fits lots of different cameras. So I plan to use this when I should start to shoot with the GH4 on the next one. Um, and obviously on a, on a day shoot, so when I shot fret in, the viewfinder's indispensable because if you're trying to, you know, get focus and set your exposure and then you've got light spill, um, you know, that can be a real problem. So you, you also get night spill on a night shoot if the lights are, you know, just placed in the wrong direction. Um, so I used to, I used the zoom function, you know, when you can zoom into the image, you can click, a, there's a, you can hot, set a hotkey and then you can actually zoom in. So I'm zooming in to get the focus. Um, because it was a night shoot, I was tending to overexpose and then bring and then bring the zebras back down to an acceptable level. Um, and the the viewfinder just um, just helped me to do all that. I couldn't imagine shooting a, a movie in the day or at night and not having a viewfinder just to cut out that light spill and just let you focus on the image. I mean, you know, it's awful if it, you you've got a great shot and the, the focus is just off. You know, so I, I found that bit of kit really helpful. That was a present from the mother-in-law one Christmas. I think I was pushing it a bit because it was quite pricey, but she got it for me, so. Okay. Um, cinematic styles. Um, on fretting, I used a variety of lens lenses to kind of augment the drama. So to kind of, wh whatever the scene required, I'd pick a lens, um, you know, to en enhance that moment in the story. Um, on Sam and Dan, I mostly used the 28 mil. I'd say 95% of the shots were shot on the, the Hoya, the 28 mil. Um, and for the reasons we've talked about, really, um, I could um, I open up the f-stop from a depth of speed, from a depth of field. Um, also, Sam and Dan get lost are about two guys that get lost in an urban environment. So I thought it would be important to always be aware so you don't have because everyone used to go mad on the shallow focus on DSLRs when they first came out. So I thought it was important to, you know, make sure that the urban environment, where the fact that they were lost was always in frame. So that was another aesthetic reason for using the 28 mil. And also changing lenses, especially with the adapters as, and under low light conditions, it just, it's, you know, it's five, 10 minutes 
probably 10 minutes out of the shoot just to change a lens and then get back into the flow. So it was, it was also to save time. And also, as you know, wide angle lenses, when you're shooting a close up, tend to uglify people. They're not, you know, flattering portrait lens like a, an 80 mil. So, cause hopefully I'm aiming for a comedy with Sam and Dan get lost. I thought that might um, help us as well. Um, so the shooting style, sorry, I'm just gonna, right. Sam and Dan Get Lost is probably my most uncinematic um, kind of film. Like I so say, when you're doing your shorts, you're throwing all the tricks in there and then you start to ease up a little bit. Fretting, I'm still trying to show off a little bit and, you know, use the correct, you know, use a lens to make, make a certain effect. But for this film, I just wanted the characters just to kind of tell the story. Um, at the time, I was watching um, Kings of the Road, um, and Alex Cox's Repo Man, Repo Men, sorry, um, and Robbie Muller, I don't know, yeah, Robbie Muller, Muller who um, shot those two films, he gave some advice to Alex Cox, which was shoot your two main leads in a two shot. Um, and it's easy to cover a scene, you do your wide, you do your medium close-ups, you do your close-ups, and then edit it together, but it can look a little bit like TV. So I kind of made a conscious decision taking Rob, Robbie Muller's advice and to try and shoot my two main leads in two shots. In scenes where I knew that there was more heightened drama, I would punch in and get a close up as well, you know, because it gives you that option in the edit to go in for a close up just so you can see the face, the landscape of the face. But um, I just tried to take Robbie Muller's or Muller's advice and, um, and shoot in two shots. So that was a a decision I made at the start. And also, again, that speeds up the shoot because you're not getting as much coverage. I have to say the two actors, Richard and Rob, um, Richard's got a background in theatre and they were like machines when it comes down to, you know, moving their hands at the right, at the same time in different shots. They were just fantastic. I was, when I was editing it, I was like, these guys are robots, you know, but in a good way. Um, yeah, so. Okay, obviously it's a night film. And even though the Sony A7S can see into the night, um, you still need to light it. And I wanted to give Sam and Dan Get Lost um, quite a stylized look. So I got these two portable 10 watt um, lights from Screwfix and they hold a charge for about four hours, maybe five hours. And it's got a high and a low setting. So you've got a little bit of control. And because I'm a cheapskate, I wanted some gels. I wanted some blue gels obviously to mimic the, the moonlight um i bought some um stationary dividers you know the clear and colored stationary dividers i got because they're so much cheaper than buying some light gels and obviously there's no heat off these um lights so yeah that was my solution to actually add some color into the night shots um the downside with these they are flood they are kind of designed to be floodlights so it's a bit harder to spot them you have to, you know you have to kind of move them around a bit to control them but um so the decision that paul hans who was the guy that lit it and myself made was um we'd always try and choose a location that had a primary practical light like a street light or maybe like a shop window and that would almost um give you a key light and then we'd augment that with the the blue light sometimes we had to have a key light with one of the lights without a blue gel and then have another light with the blue gel on it um and in most urban situations you can you can find somewhere that where you've got you know really you know a really good light and then just kind of fill it in um so on this shot here this this it's an orange light this was an industrial estate nearby and then i think I don't know if we've got two blue, two of the, the two blue screw fix lights on this side, and then the rest of this is just natural light. But yeah, so that that was the the kind of the lighting method was to go with the practical and then augment it with um, the blue light. So I wanted a slightly, you know, that 1980s kind of look in films like, you know, The Goonies or Back to the Future, where it's kind of, I mean, it's come back now, but more subtle with the grading, the orange and teal, but that orange and blue, you know, that just, in my head, that just seemed to be really 80s. And I wanted that kind of vibe. So, hence the blue gels. One thing that me and my wife did is we drove around Hinkley and the Neaton. I mean, all the, um, all the rock and roll hotspots. This was actually a location in the film. This was a load of bunched, um, um, sorry, ditched um, refrigerators in an industrial estate. 
um, just to get a sense of what's out there. Because as far as I see, if we're shooting on the A7S and it's really sensitive, it's basically free production values. As I said, not many of my films take place indoors. So I think it's hard to make them look exciting and special but you know out there in fretting and, and the canal side and out in the countryside and then in the urban environments there are um yeah they, i mean it might seem a bit low grade but you, you know picking a location that suits the, the mood of each scene there's you know there's this building just on the ring road that i noticed that has, that's lit up green every night this was a car wash at the bottom right there was a lock shop and like i say these this was an industrial estate where they just kind of dumped stuff and then it got collected every week um so yeah so just kind of you know we went out and made sure that we were organized with regards to the locations we were going to shoot however there is a downside to that which i'll come to um because we were shooting um, within just a few miles, like two or three miles of um, our home in Hinckley, it gave us a chance to, for you know, everyone to come and turn up about two, three o'clock in the afternoon. And we rehearsed the big scenes in the conservatory that doubled up as our um, rehearsal room. Um, because we'd written, because I'd written the script so quickly, because I knew that Richard and Rob were improv actors, we did leave space for improvisation. So this was a time where we'd work through the scene and we'd just do a, a reading sat down. And then when they were comfortable and we'd bashed it around a bit, we'd put it on its feet and maybe go out into the garden and walk it around a bit. Um, but we just had the option to rehearse, you know, get everyone here in the daylight, rehearse, then get them in costume and then be at the first location just as the sun was setting, film. And then if we had another big scene that night, come back home and rehearse again. Or if there were smaller scenes, then just go for it and actually rehearse in location. But I think it's only fair for the actors because actors do something I just could never do. it. I just get stage fright and I can't remember two lines of dialogue. So, you know, I think it's just fair to give them that space just to kind of, you know, hone their craft and be comfortable, you know. So that, that seemed to work out really well for us. That like rehearse, go and shoot, come back. So, we've got a trailer for Sam and Dan Get Lost. Here we go. Oops, sorry. Hold on. Um, I made a massive mistake when I cut the trailer. Oh, sorry. When I cut the trailer for fretting, I howled loads back. I thought, you know, there's a common thing about trailers these days, and people say, oh, you, you know, they, they tell the whole story within the trailer. Um, well, I thought I'm not going to do that with Fretton. I'm, I'm going to hold things back. And there's a real character that worked, used to work at the Crown in the Neaton. She was the bar, one of the bar managers there, um, Nelly, Katharina Melanie. And I, I wrote a part for her. She, play, she basically plays a middle-aged woman in a fairy costume who dances around in the middle of town. And I kept that out of the trailer because I thought, well, I've got to save that as a surprise. And uh, I've realized that you cut a trailer to sell to distributors and then if you were ever lucky enough to be taken on by a distributor, you can, you can then cut another trailer that holds things back. So I didn't hold anything back. I've kind of given everything away. But anyway, here we go. It was a night like any other for Sam, arguing with his girlfriend. It just about says everything about you, doesn't it? Walking out, typical. I see you took your stupid guitar with you. But all that changed with a chance encounter. You're not planning on driving that, are you? Not in that uh, state. One moment of madness started it all. Whoa. Trump drive off route 66 for the foreseeable. And then he met Dan. Is that I've got out in the street and I'm holy crap. What? Who are you? Something hit me. And then they hit the road. Sam. Daniel. <laughs> and then things went from bad to worse. I've got one pound. 30. They'll have to work together to get home. Where are we? Oh, yes, thank you. Very useful. What's happening? You, you stag do finish early, did it? <laughs> You've got no friends or family to call on. When was the last time you played that thing in public? Not for years. What is it? I'll get stage fright. Sooner or later, someone's got to come along. Ow! They'll see the kindness and the strangeness of strangers. <laughs> Everyone has their breaking point, okay? Well... Hey! Evening, officer. We need help. 
So today, I have been hit in the head with a bottle of vodka. Yes. Got. What's that? Oh, don't worry about Hugh Hefner over here. Had my wife's car stolen? Yes. Daniel? What are you looking at? She reminded me of my daughter! So we gave him one little pill. <laughs> and two little pills. <laughs> and now I'm stuck in the middle of God's clothes wear with a man with a dead phone in my dressing gown. First I've got to get you home, Cinders. Come on. Pinch me. Don't act weird, Daniel. It was acting weird. A new British road movie without the car. Is that something about your faith in human kindness? Degenerate oikes! But we've got the money. Let's just get on something with wheels and get home. Oh. Robert George Lane. I'm oh, you why that Richard Baldwin. What I thought I'd do most in the whole world is rip myself out for an evening. Sam and Dan get lost. Two strays, one night, and no clue. Okay, so that's come out of that. We're nearly there now, you'll be glad to know. So, lessons learned in shooting Sam and Dan get lost. Um, as I say, we're about 95% there um, with the shooting. Lockdown just cut us short, obviously, however many months ago it was now, four or five months ago. We've just got a few short scenes um, to shoot. Um, and then and then we'll be there um so one of the mistakes i made um because it's a night film and obviously with light in every scene um i should have used something that i learned about called upstage lighting or reverse key lighting which is where you have the main key light almost behind the actor's head and then you see the lovely contours of their face because the light the light's not just fully you know full from the front um and in a few scenes in samadan get lost we Maybe I was rushing it a bit too much, but we we lit it, uh, you know, from the from the front, and there's just no interest. Um, and then you need to work your magic in, in the grey to kind of, um, you know, make it work. So, if I had it to do all over again, I would pay a little bit more attention to um, upstage lighting from lighting just behind the actor's head and really getting that visual interest. And it seems to be a technique that a lot of cinematographers use. So, that's one takeaway. Um, the locations, you need to balance a great location so it looks great through the lens of, of the camera and obviously on the sensor with how easy it is to record the dialogue. Um, we're in one location and we've got a great um, electricity um, switching station behind us. It all lit up and it was fantastic. But it was on a corner and cars were just continually coming up. So we, we can't, sorry. Um, so that didn't work. Um, and the thing is, I'm loath to do much ADRing because it's so hard. Um, it's hard on the actors. It's hard, and you know, unless you've got a sorry, my microphone. Um, it's just tough. So you don't want to be doing ADR on something that's 90 minutes long when you're making it for the price of two packets of chips. So yeah, so lesson learned was just it, the location might look great, but you need to consider your sound. Um, when we were shooting Neville Rumble, we, sh we shot a, a scene under some trees and there was just a light breeze and just the breeze through the leaves was just enough that Richard really had to heavily EQ the sound. You know, so you've got to think with your ears as well as your eyes when you're making a film because obviously you, the sound's probably more important than the image. Um, shooting under neon lights. I found this, it was on one of the recce shots earlier i found this great location it was um a car wash and it had blue and pink neon lights and it's far enough away from the road for the sound so that was great um but i thought that these neon lights could really be my key light and i wouldn't need much fill and i used a little bit of blue fill light and a little bit of a rim light but i just lost the information in the shadows and i've got um, an online editor down in london and he kindly took the scene and tried to fix it um with some denoising software um but he he still recommended a reshoot i mean i'm gonna i've not actually graded it yet but yeah don't trust neon light and don't think it's going to give you a good key because it doesn't so there's another scene i shot it with neon light and it was a lock shop and it it had some um, neon in the shop window but I actually, I keyed that with my own lights and that's came out fine and, and the neon is still strong. So yeah, don't rely on neon to be your key because you might get into problems. Um, another lesson learned was the exposure. I, um, 
I really freaked out at the start of the film because the histogram was all to the left. And at first I thought, well, you know, how are these images going to turn out? Um, but you need to be secure knowing that at the end of the day, it is a night. I mean, you look at these images here, the, the, there is lots of darkness. There's lots of rich blacks. So, you know, it is going to be exposed to the left, whatever. So on the one hand, you don't want it to be all over to the left, but you, you need to know that that's where you're going to be. At the same time, believe it or not, I had a Sony A7S and there's a, early on when I was still learning, I should have probably done more tests before I started to shoot, but I felt the time pressure. So I didn't quite, you know, I did a couple of nights, but probably not enough. Um, there's a couple of scenes that are underexposed. And as you know, once you've lost that information, it's, you know, it's really hard to, to bring it back or, you know, or it may be impossible. So even if you're shooting on an A7S, which is this magical camera that can see into the night, edge on overexposing and getting an image that's got the information because you can always bring it back you can always darken it down in post so yeah using the legendary a7s i've learned to still overexpose a little bit um when i was grading fretting and that was you know 95 percent of that film took place in the day um the grading was much simpler you'd um you'd raise your highlights you'd um, crush your mid-tones you'd crush your blacks a little bit you you know and then you'd maybe add a, a blue or an orange and depending on the um you know on the emotion of the scene but grading a night film has just seemed to have taken about four times the amount of time and sometimes that's it's not grading it's color correction because the lights were too hot on the actor's face and so you've got to you know um compensate for that um, yeah, it just, it just seems a lot more, you know, it just seems to be a process that takes a lot longer. And what I've learned when you're grading a film that's shot at night is that masks are your friend. So, and sometimes there was too much blue on the actor's face. So I had to bring back, you know, I had to use masks on an actor's face. And then you, you get into the area where you've got to move the masks around. You've got to keyframe them. But, you know, masks can be great for just centering your attention where you want it to be. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd say this is a film with the most amount of masks that I've got kind of, you know, going on in, in, in the background just to really control the image. So that was another lesson learned. Expect a, a longer um, time crunch on your grading when it's a, a film shot at night. Um, I've showed you, yes, I've showed you the trailer. So onto the artwork. So I've got a friend in Devon, Mark Hartob. He's fantastic with technology. He was the guy that did some of the special effects in this film and he created our logo at the start. His, just, his brain just works that way. It's fantastic. And I also, I didn't know he could paint. So this poster here, it's actually, these are all photographs. And the idea was I, want, I wanted the film and I wanted obviously the poster to reflect that, that the fact that it's based on the 1980s kind of screwball comedies with that blue and orange. Um, and Back to the Future Team Wolf on the Goonies, they, they seem to my eye to have taken a photograph and then they have an oil paint effect over the top. Um, so I asked Mark to replicate that and I, I you know, I think I, I said, I don't know you were a painter, mate. I think he's done a terrific job. Um, you know, it's really interestingly because uh, Mark used to come to non eaten movie makers before he went down to Devon. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, well, some of you may know him then. He's a great guy and he's really talented and um. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's just on board. I mean, he's getting to the point where he's going to launch his career again soon. Um, so he's looking to build a, a portfolio. So we kind of both win. Um, we wanted to show all the eccentrics on the poster as well. So obviously you've got on the main image, you've got our two guys. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of these eccentrics we actually filmed on the last night before lockdown. So we've, we've got some hens. The, 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 our guys encounter some hens and there's a couple of guys in costumes that just randomly start to fight. I haven't actually, because of the lockdown, I've not filmed the two main actors, their responses to all this. But anyway, the idea of the poster was um, was to kind of get some of the eccentrics that they meet, a little bit like Scorsese's After Hours, you know, it's got like a dark night of the soul. Um, and then obviously the font kind of um, fits in with that, you know, it's a mad, mad, mad world kind of, you know, 60s kind of vibe. Um, it's probably something I didn't push enough on fretting. I think I, I was at a stage where I'd read that Woody Allen just used the same font for all of his titles. But I really think at the start of a film, you want to set the tone. So I think I've learned the lesson on this one um, with the font that we're using is to really just, you know, kind of set the tone of the film from the off. Okay. I mean, that's me, Angie, really. What I've got is three or 
two or three scenes for, if we've got time that I'm happy to share and give you like two or three minutes of some of the key scenes in the film if everyone's happy to do that yeah I'm, I'm sure uh, everybody really loves to see the films that they've heard being talked about um L Lee you've covered so much this evening and um those that can stay please stay and see these last three three clips that Lee's got queued up I think that'd be really great okay here we go so 12 21 just have to bear with me while I um, get it to the right spot. Just bear with. Back seat of your car and you... Mark Hartop did the special effects that are coming up as well, Angie, just to let you know. Dressing gown. I hardly think you're qualified to talk about normal evenings. Or are you in the habit of casually carjacking of a weekend? Look, you're starting to give me as much grief as I get at home and I walked out on her. So don't you start. Leave it out. <laughs> so, how did you get to here, mate? Oh, the big question. Look, with me, mate, it's no BS, yeah? It's rock and roll. Cut to the chase. Come on, what's your story? Well, uh, Emma, my daughter, ever since Kellyanne had her, she's changed. Changed how? <laughs> we always used to be like a pair of love-struck teenagers. That's nice. Always laughing, joking around. It's like I'd married my best friend as well as my soulmate. <laughs> now the laughter's gone. Taking our sex life with it as well. Ooh. Oh dear. So what you're saying is that, is that your love with Kellyanne has flown out the window like some exotic bird. Yeah. Mate, you should make a statement. Do something that she couldn't possibly ignore. What, like... Like, take away something she loves? Yeah, exactly. Perfect. <laughs> the only thing she cares about is this bloody car! Really? Bollocks! Oh! Oh, mate, calm down! It's only... Look, the car, it, it's only a thing, isn't it? No! No, it's a symbol! Is it? Look, mate, I think you should calm down a little bit. I mean, you might have concussion or PTSD or IBS. All right, maybe not IBS, but look, maybe just calm down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, wait, what are you doing with that? Look, what are you doing? Don't do anything rash. I thought you were just going to put the car on Auto Trader or something like that. I can't put it on Auto Trader. I haven't got the logbook. What? Uh. Oh. Oh, what you love is the Kellyanne, yeah? So you go in a supply room now. Mate, this seems a little bit drastic yeah? now, to be honest. <laughs> Look, are you sure that this is really what you want to be doing? He's going to get your bottle now, yeah? Look, just think about what you're doing. Is this the only thing you love? Oh. See how much you love it now. <laughs> so, I've got one pound thirty. My phone is nearly dead. Don't put the over there. Oh, my, my key's still in the ignition. Well, that's where they're staying now, I'm afraid. I can't get back in the house without those. Well, you should have thought of that before you set fire to the car, shouldn't you? One pound thirty. Yeah, well, I had more, but I gave some to a hobo. Well, on you, the philanthropist. What? Well, look at you, Arthur Dent, flashing your junk at everyone, out and about. Oh, well, at least I'm not the 
lost little boy that runs away from home and has to go round and round the block because he's not allowed to cross the road. Who leaves home without a wallet? Who leaves home without their clothes on? So, um, are we staying here and explaining this to the feds then or what? I don't know. I just was onto a shorter scene. Thank you. So met some good Samaritans. Here we go. When I can find it. Come on. Here we go. It's like a semion. You keep the semion to yourself. Look, where are we? Oh yes, thank you. Very useful. But, no, but this is my point. What? If we don't know where we are, mm -hmm. what's the point of phoning anyone? <laughs> That's very good, isn't it? That excellent, superb. Look, if you knew that, why didn't you say something while we're trying to work out who to phone? I'm only trying to help. Thank you. Oh, no, no, come on. I was only trying to save your battery. <laughs> the boss of him mate. Yeah. How much for half an hour? Yeah, yeah. Do, you do, uh, do you do half an hour? <laughs> You'll have to ask him, he's a sole trader. Street trader? Come on, show us the goodies. No mate, like I said, forget it, what's the point? Oh, hang on a minute, we're only messing about. What's happening? You, you stag do finish early, did it? <laughs> Look, it looks really cold out there. Yeah, it is really cold out here, obviously. Yeah. Well, it's lovely and toasty in here. Yeah. Full heated leather seats, the works. Come on, lads. Do you want to lift up the surfaces? Good idea. Yes, please. Thank you so much. You've restored my faith in human kindness. Chosser! Wanker! <laughs> Is that something about your faith in human kindness? The degenerate oiks! Strong, but fair. Hey, shall I, can I show you one more before I go? Who are we to stop? Oh, yeah, go where on. is she? That, it's just... Horrific! Horrific! So, today... No, actually, I checked. Oh, in public, just bear with me. No. Me! So I said, um, this is probably the most uncinematic. I just let the camera hang back and have two shots. Um, in this scene, um, Sam's kind of confesses that he gets stage fright. So what I did is I put the camera really high above him, looking down, and then I had a converse shot looking up at um, Richard. And it's one of the few occasions where I just use the camera angles just to help tell the story and usually I have a friend in, in Australia that watched watched the rough cut and said it's almost like a stage play but if you, the next minute is just an example of just using your camera height to kind of make the camera look a, make the character look a bit more pathetic hey what is it I'll get stage fright. All right? Look, I love the writing part. I've been a singer-songwriter. But the performing live in front of people, it's just never really suited me. In fact, nine times out of 10, it makes me sick. Well, the only way I can think of of getting us some travel. Okay, and I've got one more clip. Uh, I've selected, where is it? Oh, the police, right, 3155, okay. <clears throat> so, 
Oh, this is the um, this is the the shot with the neon lighting where I actually I got the light levels fine. I actually used the screw fix lights as a key light, and so the neon wasn't a problem. But you can just see the neon in the background that works quite well. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen Ice Age, but there's a character in there called Scrat. It's like this little character that just kind of pops really up smiling and acts as a punctuation within the story. Um, and we just have this notion of this policeman that they just encounter, but it's, it's like a really naughty policeman. So he smokes and has snacks and tries to do his Rubik's Cube. Um, so this is just the first scene where they come across him. Um, and this was played by Mark Granger. He's predominantly a, um, he's in a band, but he's also a, a funny guy. So again it was just using your resources writing a role for someone that you know here he so fished all the pieces out the bin taped them back together again man i regret that you know perhaps fixing the photograph shouldn't be the top of your list perhaps you could try fixing the relationship I think I would. If I knew I just uh... Control. Could you ask your friend to Pretoria, please? Policeman? Yes, a police. Man. 474 to control over. Why don't you go and ask him for directions? Why? Why? We've got an officer in danger. Could you respond straight away, please? It's down on the high street. Over. It looks very big and important. Big. 474, what are you doing? I'm just, I'm just busy. Over. Isn't anybody else who can take it? Yeah, but he probably knows where we are, doesn't he? You could ask him. 474, I, I think someone else is responding to it now, so... I've got another job for you if you're ready for something for. Well, look, I got us to the town centre. It's your time to do something now. I say, I'm, I'm, I am a bit tied up at the minute. What's, what's the job? It'd be a bit better coming from you, Mr. Fancy Pants, with your clothes and everything. It's a missing cat. Over. Missing cat? Yeah, but I'm going to feel so stupid. I mean, who gets lost at my age? 474, a missing cat. I'd be immediately arrested for indecent exposure. Mm. A cat? A missing cat? Well, I suppose I could just walk over to him and explain what's happened. I'm a bit busy at the minute. I'm sure he's reasonable, like most police officers. Leave out the bit about the car burning, OK? Oh. Yeah, obviously I wasn't going to mention that, was I? But don't wet yourself, it's only arson. Oh, actually, hold on, Control, I've uh, got something else to look into. I'll be back in a minute. You'd get, what, three, four, twelve years? Thanks for the reminder, Sam. Mm. Everyone has their breaking point, OK? Well... Heard of the monkey and the organ grinder, but uh, this is brand new. This really takes the biscuit. <laughs> Evening, Evening, officer. A good stag do, was it, lads? Yes, yeah, very, very good. On your way home now, are you? Yeah. yeah. Wending your way? Something like that, yeah. Okay. Keep it orderly, gents. Right. right. Well Evening. done. Evening. You say something! Banny. Self proclaimed tit. So I'll leave it there, I think, or else I'll bore you with the whole film. But that location, um, because it was a winter, the central heating kept coming on and off. And so we heard the vent outside. So some shots would have the vent, some shots we wouldn't. So I had to put the, you know, an, an outward flew all the way through that scene and try and mix it. So that was one of those lovely things that you do in the edit that no one will notice. But again, it's all about checking the locations. Although, you know, there's probably not much you could have could have done about that. But um, I'm probably going to leave it there. And thank you for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Lee. That's been really great. And as I said before, you've covered so much stuff. Um, I've been blown away by how much there is to take in. And I'm. <laughs> hope, hope I've taken in maybe even half of it, and I'll be happy. Um, can we just give uh, Lee a little clap because uh, he's just stood, stood, <laughs> helped, stood in well, at the last minute and helped us all out with that. So thank you, Lee. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's informative. 
<laughs> um, we'll of course um, update with any of the links and the PowerPoint on the website and Facebook. But yeah, let's open it for questions. Thanks, Lee. Who's going first? <laughs> Go on, Brian. Um, with the uh, the effects of the car burning, who done that for you? Did you say? Okay, uh, there's a chap down in Devon. There's a Nuneaton lad I went to school with him, uh, Mark Hartop. Um, so basically we filmed the plates, so the car, um, in, in the location here in Hinkley. Um, and we, add, we added in some flame effects just sort of on the floor with some gels, you know, just kind of wiggling them around. And then he, he did the rest, you know, kind of... Um, oh, really? We had to t measure the car. He was Because obviously these special effects guys are really kind of uh, <laughs> angry retentive, and quite rightly so. So we had to measure the car. We had to photograph it from the front and the side in case he wanted to actually create a map of the side of the car for right. you know um so yeah so we sent him all that information and then he, he sent that back to us so yeah that was done in that was after effects was it um i couldn't tell you i could find out uh, no 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 can't remember true. i don't know no probably I, I don't think it was after effects but he has told me and because i'm not really a techie it kind of didn't stick sorry thank you but the whole oh, okay. sequence was very, very effective. Gosh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good friend. <laughs> I bet, yeah. It was very, very effective, I thought that was. On the two actors, just to let you know, we were going to use the same effect where we had some gels in front of the light and wiggle it in front of their face. And I think we did experiment with light, actually lighting some newspaper as well. I think it was a combination of the two. And those um, embers that come up in front of their face, they were added on afterwards as well. Right. They don't quite work as well because it, they, it would be better on a, a, lo a larger focal length because if you you know if you've got a zoom lens you've got all that all the atmosphere haven't you for things to happen but I think we get away with it even though you said I'm pushing it a bit but yeah so <laughs> so we put those ambers in to kind of link those two shots together in yeah. spatially you know. <clears throat> Brilliant, Lee. I don't know if you want to cancel your screen share so we can get the the benefit view in full, almost HD. <laughs> that's lovely a any more questions anyone yeah um can i just inquire what um what, what audience did you have in mind when you when you sort of designed the film in the first place who 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 will you be expecting to show it to and what sort of situations it's always a question that you ask yourself isn't it because if you've got a few swear words in there and it's something i've asked myself on the next film is like how do you pitch it um you know what, I've got to be honest, it happened so quick that I probably didn't have an audience in mind. And because no one's paid me to do it, I just thought I'll follow my heart. So I don't really think I gave it that much forethought. But however, we were stripping out some more of the some of the more severe swear words. I remember having conversations in the conservatory going, you know, do we really need that? Um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, not much in pre-production, but then afterwards, yeah, we were playing catch up. So might have missed a trick, but yeah, it was, it's, yeah, not much. <laughs> What's the overall length of the film as it stands at the moment? It's just a touch over 90 minutes. And because I want to add in a few short scenes, I've got, it does need tightening anyway, but I think for a comedy, I think you've got to aim for 90 minutes just because, just so it can, you know, briskly fly by. I think anything over that's indulgent. So I'm aiming for that classic 90 minutes, but it's just a tad over with titles as well. Um, yeah. You've actually finished it, have you? Well, I've got a cut now with everything I've got and with all the feedback that I've, that I've been given. Um, there's just little scenes that I want to film because it just... Partly for pacing reasons, I've got this notion. I've got, got and I've actually, I've got the mattress. So I've got, I've got this mattress and a, and a bedstead. So it looks like a discarded bed. And then literally, um, Richard, the guy in the dressing gown, just walks by, flops over without a word, and then Robert just comes by, just looks at him, and then he gets up, and then they just walk on. And it's probably a thirty, forty-five second scene, but just little things like that. And there's another one with a clothes bank where, um, oh, my wife's, you all right? Um, where Sam's just digging out some clothes and of course it's a big floppy summer hat, a blouse. You know, again, it's 30 seconds, 45 seconds, a bit of visual humour because it's very talky and I just, so I just wanted some slapstick and some, and just to pace it. So yeah, bar that and buy a, a final pass where I tighten everything. It's, um, yeah, we're almost there, but of course lockdown happens. So yeah, but it's, it's given me time to reflect, which is great.
And, and as an outsider, how will we be able to view the film? Well, I'm going to try and get distribution. I did start to go down that path because obviously I was on lockdown, got lots of time on my hands and I realise it's not quite the time because if I do get a bite from the trailer and a distributor wants to see it, I'm going to send them an online screener. Um, so I've just obviously, I've got a distributor um, based in Spain, um, an aggregator called Render Yard, um, and I know they're waiting in the wings, but I mean, the dream is to get it on DVD and Asda, but it, it's that letter from Duncan at High Flyer, so that's getting even less likely. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I'm just going to try and push it probably when it's shot. So I guess it'll be shot this Christmas. And then in the spring, we'll try and, you know, and I'm not in it for the money, you know, it, yeah, I, no. just want, I just want an audience. So Neville Rumble, yeah. Fretting and Wasted, you can find all of those, probably Amazon Prime. Is your, is, your, is your best shot. But, and if anyone does want to leave a review or, or star it, can I just put that pitch out there now? That would be awesome because that really helps us because Fretton's kind of stagnated now. And I, do, I think that's my most family friendly film. And that's on Amazon Prime. I think we've got 36 reviews now and quite some, some quite good stars. So, yeah, that's my sales pitch. I think that's the least we can do considering you've given us your time this evening, Lee. So, thank you for that. Thank you. Last call for any questions? <coughs> Yeah, just to say thanks, Angie and Lee, for a good evening. No, Thoroughly right. enjoyed it. No, I love talking about it. So until the good film, night. Night, so you're welcome. Night, night. Thank you. Thank you. Very much indeed. Absolutely. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, on behalf of everybody at Van Eaton Movie Makers, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Lee. Be well, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lee, for taking taking to it so well uh, I, I contacted Lee over Facebook and said would you do a talk for us because it's locked down and we haven't got any meetings going on and Lee very gamely agreed to do it so thank you Lee um, you're welcome I'm sorry with no brief from me whatsoever jars, Lee. pardon good to see you recycling jars <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah that's great 